The Chesapeake Bay restoration and conservation movement is nearly 50 years old. What started with advocacy and litigation, essential to galvanize action, has now fully entered the implementation and quantification phase. Partners throughout the watershed are focused on delivering results on the ground. We're witnessing the dawn of a new era for our society in the Bay Movement, one where we regularly employ advanced technology and intense collaboration to move from an effort-based initiative to a results-oriented community. I'm Joel Dunn, and welcome to the first episode of Chesapeake Conversations. I'm the president and CEO of the Chesapeake Conservancy, which is a nonprofit based in Annapolis, Maryland. We're a team of conservation entrepreneurs who believe that the Chesapeake is a national treasure that should be accessible for everyone and a place where wildlife can thrive. We use technology to enhance the pace and quality of conservation, and we help build parks, trails, and public access sites. This podcast will take a look at what's working and what's not for the Chesapeake Bay. There is so much to celebrate regarding progress in the restoration and protection of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. In the past decade, water clarity has begun to show signs of improvement. Rockfish, oysters, and blue crab populations are rebounding. Underwater grasses have hit record levels in recent years, and we continue to conserve critical lands and enhance public access. Other than the land conservation and public access results, Approximately 60% of these improvements can be attributed to point source or end-of-pipe solutions, primarily upgrades at major wastewater treatment plants like Blue Plains in Washington, D.C. If we're to succeed in meeting our water quality goals, the next decade of action will need to focus on non-point source pollution, such as farm and urban runoff, which is much more difficult to tackle. Fortunately, we've entered the age of data-driven conservation. Cloud computing, geographic information systems, and remote sensing have completely changed the realm of the possible and allowed us to model non-point source pollution as well as opportunities for precise intervention. As a result, the time has come for organizations and agencies to be evaluated on measurable results that can be directly tied to their activities. As Joe Whitworth eloquently points out in his book, Quantified, Redefining Conservation for the Next Economy, this shift will revolutionize public, private, and philanthropic investments in the environment by changing their focus to quantified outcomes. And thank goodness, because these new approaches need to become the norm, not the exception, in order to address the severity of our environmental problems. Since its establishment in 1983, The Chesapeake Bay Program has prided itself on using science and consensus to make ecosystem restoration and conservation decisions. Rapid advancements in geospatial analysis have helped us understand the landscape and revolutionized how we monitor, model, evaluate, and even govern the Chesapeake Bay. Every version of the Bay Program's watershed model, now in its sixth iteration, has used extensive data for best management practices, land use and cover, point sources, septic systems, federal population and agricultural census data, and other sources of pollution information. These linked models also incorporate precipitation, meteorological, soil, and elevation data, and all are linked to national airshed models and land use change models. These environmental simulations give us an unprecedented understanding of how the watershed works and serve to estimate pollution loadings based on land use patterns and pollution reductions stemming from the implementation of pollution control measures. The Bay Program Partnership is halfway through the implementation of the Chesapeake Bay Total Maximum Daily Load, or Pollution Diet, as it's more commonly referred to. As part of the process, the partners agreed to conduct a midpoint assessment 
to determine whether the jurisdictions have achieved 60% of the pollution reductions required to meet their pollution allocations by the 2025 deadline. In recent years, the ability to collect, manage, and analyze mountains of data has improved exponentially. Important Bay model improvements include incorporating new information on climate impacts, such as increased water temperature and sea level rise, newly approved best management practices, such as land conservation and restoring oyster reefs, phosphorus saturated soils, lag times that are due to contaminated groundwater, and water quality data and monitoring trends. One of the largest changes in the midpoint assessment is the resolution at which the model runs. Earlier versions relied on 30 meter resolution land cover data, which was the state of the art at the time. At that level of resolution, each pixel represented about a quarter acre on the ground, and sources of pollution and the loading rates associated with various land uses had to be generalized at the county level. This could result in erroneous or inaccurate land use designations, misidentification of pollution sources, and other anomalies. In 2011, the Bay Program recognized and acknowledged the need to make improvements in the model and its data sources to more accurately simulate the watershed. The Chesapeake Conservancy, in collaboration with the Bay Program's land use and modeling work groups and other partners, created high-resolution land cover and land use data at a one-meter level for the entire watershed. We will be providing updates in 2021 and 2024. This new classification provides much greater information and greater accuracy compared with the conventional 30-meter resolution data. In addition, the Land Use Work Group obtained updated land use information for more than 80% of the local governments in the watershed. The combination of high-resolution land cover data with updated land use information provides a much more accurate and precise representation of what is occurring on the land throughout the watershed. In short, we have much better data. With new high-resolution data sets, The Bay Program and its partners will be able to evaluate land use change at one meter over time to determine whether the jurisdictions will need to offset any increases in nutrient and sediment loadings from new sources or increases from existing sources. Chesapeake Conservancy recently hired a data scientist to leverage artificial intelligence to decrease the amount of time it takes to update the watershed's land cover data. The high-resolution land cover data also creates an opportunity to identify where conservation and restoration actions are needed, such as defining the extent of riparian forest buffers and urban tree canopy. Already, the Conservancy has used this data along with light detection and ranging data, or LIDAR, which provides elevation information, to produce high-resolution maps of waterways, including an inventory of roadside ditches throughout two counties in Pennsylvania, a significant but unaccounted-for source of nutrient sediment pollution. Work is underway to expand the analysis watershed-wide. The Chesapeake Bay restoration movement has made great strides. Together, we've tackled large problems such as upgrading wastewater treatment plants, to such a degree that they've already met their 2025 pollution reduction goals. But it's clear we will not reach our water quality standards by using the same approaches and practices that have allowed us to get to this point. Now we need to face the most Herculean of all tasks, working acre by acre on targeted restoration projects. The time for data-driven precision conservation has arrived, and the data is here to support it. For more information about Chesapeake Conservancy, check out our website at www.chesapeakeconservancy.org. Chesapeake Conversations is produced by Platform Media. Our music is by Scott McDaniel from Wild Echo Media. Special thanks to our partners and donors who make our work possible. I'm Joel Dunn.